Welcome to the Cruise Lifestyle. Well, thanks, Bruce, for, for coming along again. Good to good to catch up, and we'll catch up on the stories that have been happening in the last, uh, last week or so. My pleasure. Around the world of cruise. Um, Stuart Muramel, is that how you pronounce it? So he's, he's moving on to the to the UK, so there's a few changes at Carnival Australia. Yeah, and, and moving on very quickly. So so Stuart has been, um, he's been with Carnival for a number of, or for many years um, in Australia, um, I think since about 20, certainly heading up Carnival Australia since 2015. I think he might have been here for more than a decade, but um, received a well-deserved promotion. Um, so heading off to head up Carnival UK, uh, you know, that where they've got P&O UK as part of the portfolio, he might actually have a P&O brand that can actually sail. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it happened very quickly. So so his, his appointment's been announced and he's actually starting his new job in uh, Southampton, I think it is, on the 18th of October. So wow. I'll see, okay. might have been transit now. Um, so yes, big changes for Carnival Australia. Not, not long to, uh, to pack and move really, is it? No, that's right. And so he's being replaced by Marguerite Fitzgerald, who I haven't met, um, but she's an Australian who's returning to Australia after many years overseas. And I think, uh, reading between the lines, she's worked very closely with, she's from Boston Consulting, so she's a management consultant, um, but has been based in Miami for a long time, uh, dealing with uh, lots of cruise lines, uh, and I presume you know, very well known to Carnival. And uh, so, yes, very familiar with uh, what needs to happen within these cruise businesses to make them, make them hum. Do you think it would signal a change in direction for Carnival Australia a bit, or...? Um, look, no, I don't think so. I, I think that Carnival Australia, it's definitely part of the, um, you know, it's got an important role to play in the global uh, Carnival, uh, you know, portfolio. Um, mm. As we, I think we've said before, you know, it's the ninth brand, Pino Australia, uh, is part of the portfolio. Uh, the ninth brand, the only one that's not currently sailing. Um, you know, I, look, it's been a very tough year for all of the cruise lines in the local market. Um, but, uh, so, you know, look, I'm, I'm sure that Sture is looking forward to a new challenge. Um, and I think Marguerite's, you know, she's coming in at a great time in terms of, you know, I mean, we don't have any certainty yet, but surely cruise has got to restart soon. And so she'll be presiding over all of that. But she doesn't start until uh, January, I think. So, okay. um, you know, hopefully there'll be some stuff happening before then. Um, and speaking of, I guess, restarting, Grand Princess was the first one to sail out of Los Angeles recently yeah and look a lot of restarts happening um you know it's great to see sailing out of california where um they've had uh, quite an extreme you know i mean when we say extreme nothing like australia but in terms of the us um you know lots of mandates about masks and vaccinations etc compared to other parts of america um and so a great sign to see that even in that market where uh, they've been locked down a lot um i think they call them stay shelter in place orders um to see that even in a place like that, crews can restart, you know, surely is a beacon for the Australian market. I hope so. <laughs> we say that every week, don't we? Yeah, surely no, it's a beacon for sure it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Silver Sea. Yeah. Not, not normally ones to to do TV advertising, but they're, they've obviously got a campaign. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that this is a, um, a bit of an indication of the new ownership, or, you know, it's a couple of years old now, but uh, of Royal Caribbean. Um, you know, they've got lots of backing. But, you know, interesting to see how they'll be targeting these TV ads um, to a fleet that is, I mean, you know, it's not a small fleet, but they're not big ships. And so mm -hmm. you're not going for the mass, the mass market. Um, so, yes, interesting to see how that will be received. But, you know, a great sign of confidence in the future and, you know, we often, we've seen this, you know, I think over the years we've reported on, you know, the first TV ad for, you know, XYZ, Viking Cruises or whatever. Um, the fact that Silver Sea is joining that, you know, again, you know, shows the long-term sustainability and importance of the cruise sector. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Even at the luxury end. Um, we've spoken, I guess, last few weeks, just changing subject slightly, a lot of, a lot of Antarctic sort of things happening and yep. it looks like Hurdy Gruton have, um, join the fray yeah and um, um and again I, I think that things are rapidly changing in argentina but uh where ushuaia the traditional port seems to have been much slower to get things up and running than um nearby neighbor punta arenas and so they've really swept in chile and um yes hertigruten is also going to sail out of there alongside i think it is silver sea um and i think 
Swan Hellenic, uh, which is a new um, operator, uh, you know, an old brand that um, has relaunched you know, as, as a completely new operation. They're also going to cruise to Antarctica. So, um, and also we've seen Scenic um, announce uh, an Antarctic season as well for Scenic Eclipse. So that's you know pretty. Well, it's exciting. almost it's almost like a full season down there yeah. now. It's it's um, you know everyone's sort of yeah. in the expedition. And, you know, it's interesting to me that um, we haven't heard anything from Aurora on that front, but I'm sure they are trying to make plans as well about you know what they could do to get things going. Um, and surely, I mean, they they've got a much more Australian focused source market, and so that's also you know that makes things pretty tricky. But it's only a small ship, you know. Like, could they could they get a departure away? I don't know. Um, it would be nice to see if they could. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And the other end of the, the global scale, Penance have officially launched their new expedition ship. And that's... They, they have, yeah, like Le Commandant Charcot, and um, it's been to the North Pole. I think it's on a shakedown cruise now um, to, the, to Lisbon, I think. Um, but yes, great to see. And they've also really signaled a major push into the local market um, with the appointment of Andrew Daddo as a sort of celebrity ambassador. Now look, he enjoyed a point on a cruise and, and um, they've obviously had that footage in the can for a while. Um, they've, they've now launched it, made it into, a, I think it's a 45 minute documentary, quite fascinating, you know, showing his experience. And look, he's a pretty well-known guy because I think he was on I think it was a getaway. Um, yeah, I think right? it was getaway for a while. One of the, yeah. one of the TV shows, uh, yep. travel TV shows that are now all defunct. But um, he, yes, he's he's definitely got a uh, following, a, a familiarity with travel. Um, I'm not sure how old he is, but you know, look, I'm sure he would be the type of demographic that Ponard is wanting to target, and and not just obviously about the hardcore expedition, which of course is what they offer, but also the. You know, <coughs> definitely five star on board you know french cuisine champagne etc etc um so yes that's a really interesting move and uh it will be interesting to see how that's received you know great to see that uh despite you know the travails that, that someone like Penance gone through um that they're able to be so proactive and, and be on the front foot you know there's a lot of investment going into the market there so yeah yeah great. absolutely it looks like a it looks like a brilliant documentary too so yeah yeah. Um, we'll actually sort of post the links to that on our on our website. Um, another thing, New Zealand government, they're mm. probably pretty much the same as Australia, <laughs> but maybe going a step further. Yeah, um, they've hiked their their fees to get in and out of the country. Yeah, it, it is bizarre, um, and by a significant amount too. Yeah, so they've doubled. Look, it, it's a it's a very environmentally focused government. It's a it's a you know pretty hard left Labor government, and they they really don't care about. Um, Travel and tourism, because they're they you know very or they're very concerned about the impact of travel and tourism on the environment, and so you know this is the pretext under which they do these things. But basically, yes, they've hiked, they've doubled the border processing. I'm sure they've had a look at the budget and gone, oh my gosh, you know we're not recovering nearly enough as much nearly enough money to cover the costs of all these staff that we've got employed to manage our borders. Um, so on a cost recovery basis, which is how they, they justify it, they've doubled the border processing levy for uh, airline passengers. And I think that the, the cruise one's gone from $21 per passenger to $36. Um, and the crazy thing is that this has all been done in an environment where there's you know, practically zero travel in and out. So they really can't predict what the numbers are going to be like. Mm. Um, you know, if they want to keep borders secure, I get that. But really, that's something that should be subsidised not by the passengers, um, if, if they want to get travel and tourism and cruising going. Um, so yeah, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of know, putting things in the wrong direction, isn't it? Like if you want uh, uh, to incentivise travel you know, and things like that. Yeah, and look, you know, Australia, you can criticise Queensland and um, WA for their hard border stance, but, but economically, they've got, you know, big mining operations, resources, etc. For New Zealand, you know, tourism is the number one earner Ooh. So, you know, it, it, so many businesses, so many people rely on it, and it's just going to become more of a wealth, welfare state if they don't, you know, let the brakes off and get things going again, I think. Anyway, yes, very disappointing move. Well, watch watch this space, I think, on that one, really. Yeah. And, crazy. you know, speaking along similar lines, I mean, we, we spoke about Tahiti last week and, and reducing, yeah. you know, the capacity. Um, Bar Harbour, which is up in Maine, beautiful spot up in Maine, been up yep. there and it's, it's yeah. They, you know, it, there's a real anti-cruise sentiment there, I think, in the locals. And again, it, it's all political and perhaps not recognising the benefits that 
all these visitors come when they spend stuff. But um, yep. it's been an ongoing debate in the local council. And I think they've um, the latest uh, you know resolution is that um, you know they 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 move to the next stage of considering major cuts to the number of cruise ship visits. And I think that's it's, it is quite interesting. And look, you know, maybe maybe it'll be a win-win, um, you know, except for the poor operators who've invested heavily. But there's an awful lot of ports along that, um, you know, east upper east coast of W of uh, the USA. And I wonder mm. if you know the cruise ships will just go elsewhere. Do you think this is maybe a pushback from the size of the ships that have been launched over the last few years? Like yeah. it's just yeah. getting. Yeah. excessively i mean you're, well, you're talking well, you know, six thousand passengers at a time coming into a port totally you know where do all the buses come from where where how do you manage you know the low the, the public toilets you know all sorts of things um yes it, look it, it definitely uh, that those bigger ships are a step change and for some places they really gear up and, and go to welcome them somewhere like bar harbor you know there's a lot of you know american billionaire holiday homes there um you know it's an actually beautiful place arcadia national park um mm. so it's, i guess it's got lots of other attractions and they're not so dependent on the cruise market for their economic prosperity and so yeah, that's probably part of it i'd say changing tech viking have launched their first cruises in china uh, ocean cruises. yeah um so you know torsten hagen the head of viking you know he, he's a wily he's very good at partnerships and partnerships with you know perhaps you might say, you know, regimes or, you know, Russian oligarchs. He, he made his fortune initially out of, uh, you know, doing a deal with the owners of the, a bunch of real boats on the Volga in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, so done a similar deal. You know, basically, you can't deal with the Chinese government unless you give them a, a big piece of the piece of the action. And so they've got a partnership with um, China Merchants, I think is the name of the company, but it's definitely a Chinese government owned corporation because of the, it's a communist country. Um, but so they, the Viking Sun, I think it is, they rebranded um, and this was flagged a while ago, but it's basically taken one of the uh, Viking ocean ships out of the Western uh, English speaking market that um, Torsten has always cherished. And yeah, really interesting move to just see how this is going to go. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, this is the way to do the Chinese market, you know, very serious. Um, oh. Chinese government's got a stake in it. Um, I'll be very surprised if it isn't, if it isn't a great success. But interestingly, um, lots of elements of the ship that we all love so much from the Viking product still have still remain. So the decor, you know, there's this aspiration, I think, for a Western connection from the uh, certainly the affluent Chinese travellers. Um, and so, yes, you know, the the, the Torsten Hagen quest for world domination continues. What's well, interesting because from memory, Viking don't have casinos on board do they no casinos no kids um, now i don't know if that's going to change for this one because and and you know will the itineraries change I, i'm not sure i haven't really had a close look at that but that is a very interesting point does, mm. does this signal the departure from that philosophy yeah that i mean because the chinese that, market is, is well known yeah. for the for the gambling side of things yes um, absolutely yeah yeah interesting now, it, it, going across to India, um, they've had a, a brand new cruise line startup called Delia Cruises. Oh, Delia, yes. Uh, um, but off to a rocky start. Well, you know, you wonder if this is a bit of a beat up, but um, yes, you know, as often happens on the, what, what happens on a cruise stays on a cruise, and it seems like this Cordelia, the concept of it is, you know, initially certainly very much short for cruises, where people perhaps let their hair down quite a lot. And, um, you know, there's allegations of a drug bust on board and um i think there's you know some wealthy you know heir the sign of one one of india's you know many wealthy families who's been caught uh, with this you know note was in the white powder or something like that <laughs> yes anyway it'll be fun to watch and it's and it's nice to see you know lots of cruise lines see the potential of the indian market um and to see a homegrown one you know actually getting off the ground is a, is a great achievement cost of cruises of in yeah. the process of almost rebranding I, I guess in some ways yeah. this is this is an interesting one costa obviously has had you know a rocky 
uh, you know, decade or so, uh, to coin a phrase, part of Carnival Corporation, um, and they they also had a really big focus on the Chinese market, but with an Italian product. So again, sort of showing that aspiration for Europe, etc. Um, and so, yes, they it's their Costa Smeralda is their they've got this fantastic new flagship wrapping shield, and essentially the product that is has been implemented on that ship it's going to be expanded right across the fleet. So it's particular restaurants, um, you know, there's a new logo, which is, you know, always very exciting, but change the shape of their big C on, on, the, <laughs> on the funnel. <laughs> um, but yes, very important. I, I think it's also probably a bit of a, I think they cost a, you know, Italian background, and I think probably always thought they had a, you know, a native right to dominate the Italian market, which of course MSC has come in and you know, absolutely swamped with massive programming with new builds. Um, yep. And so I think it's trying to get back a bit of that as well, you know, that, that it is a, a big alternative to to MSC, which of course is constantly innovating as well. Mm, mm. Um, now, speaking of MSC, they've, they've come out um, and starting to look at Northern Winter um, yeah. and, and yeah. cruising up the northern northern European sort of area during winter and, and running a program there, which has never really been done in any big way. No, that's right. And, and you know, the, the big ships, um, they, but as their fleet grows, of course, they've got to expand into new markets and new destinations. They ran a northern, uh, a, a northern winter summer program and that was very well received and probably you're going to get those cruises because the experience up there is so different between summer and winter you know winter you've got the um, aurora borealis you've got you know cruising at midnight i've been lucky enough to do a perturbation through the fjords up there and it's quite magical you know in the middle of the night that, oh, it's that a bucket a list summer that area is a bucket yeah. list for me, but yeah. you know winter would be sort of something else yeah. really, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I, I presume they'll get repeat guests who, who love the Northern, uh, the, the summer program. Um, there's a lot of ports up there, you know, absolutely eager. Hamburg, you know, all of the Copenhagen, all those uh, Scandinavian ports, you know, super ready to welcome ships of any size. Um, you've got the infrastructure, so why not? You know, good luck mm. to them. Because yeah. I know um, Hurtigruten have, have done quite a bit on their, on their regular services, I guess. Not yeah. so much a, a, a cruise as such, but, but more regular services that yeah, run up the, that the way. Coastal, the Coastal Express or whatever it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a great product. Closer to home. Australia's falling further behind. Everyone else in the in the world has started yeah. up. We've had two million passengers around the world that have that have already cruised post pandemic. Yeah, and, and look, of... it's interesting to see, you know, all of these um, lobbying groups it's interesting to me how sycophantic they often have to be, you know, thanking politicians for the meagre scraps that they get tossed. And I think that players are pretty much jack of it. Um, and they've really come out strongly in the last week or so saying enough is enough. Particularly where we've got these reopening plans, um, you know, Australia's, you know, we're in New South Wales at the moment and we're going to reopen significantly next Monday, the 11th of October, um, because we're at 70 per cent. Two weeks later, we'll be at 80 you know, and yet not no engagement whatsoever from any government, as far as I can tell, on cruise. Um, mm. So yes, Claire, very frustrated. Um, you know, I, I, I think we saw this week Flight Centre talking about legal action against uh, jurisdictions that are keeping borders closed. And there was a High Court case that um, brought by Clive Palmer, but backed by the federal government earlier this year, um, which was lost. But that was actually last year, based on the, 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 the premise of the loss was that there was no vaccine well now we've got a vaccine well that was that was you know, an australia sort of action I yes think. It that's, like, WA, yeah. that's right so i think the legal precedent is there you know i mean surely you don't have to resort to legal action to get a government to listen you know at 80 percent with all the protocols all the work that's been done to get cruising going surely not do you, do you think it is the next step for the for the cruise industry to actually possibly go down that path i mean is that is that what we're at i mean we, we don't seem to be getting anywhere otherwise do we um i look i, I think probably the next step is australia australia wide at 80 percent and i think that if they i think i think if you're going to threaten legal action you've got to be prepared to go through with it and i'm not sure that there is the appetite for that 
you know, Dan Tian has promised, but he's promised before, he's promised that there'll be talks at 80%. That's not far off now, um, you know. So I think that's the next step, but yes, if that doesn't happen. But I mean, they're still, they're still not providing any plans or anything. I, I mean, no, we're I still at the 80%. They've, they've yeah. said, you know, we've we'll we'll seen travel. And this week we've seen, seen Carnival Cruise Line having to defer once again um, yeah. its Australian voyages, you know. It's just, it's beyond a joke, you know, getting very frustrating. Yeah, well, I, I guess, that's the thing. I mean, at what point does the frustration boil over and we just sort of start saying, you know, yeah, <laughs> it'll be an interesting one to watch because oh, it's, it is dragging on. I mean, I, my, as you know, I, I sort of work or have worked at the, at the ports in the cruise industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I added up the days yesterday. We're up to day 569 since my last disembarkation in Australia. Oh. <laughs> So, you know, we oh. are sort of adding up there, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Just don't count. <laughs> Just let it all be up there. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's a significant amount of time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, we shall is. watch this space and see what yeah. what transpires. Um, but, yeah, it will be interesting to see what, what happens in the future and how we get, get out totally. of this, through this. Totally. And look, I think to end on a positive note, um, this this week we've seen, you know, some long term thinking by the, the cruise lines with PL Australia launching a, a fantastic around Australia itinerary. Yeah, that looks brilliant. Mm. Um, but, you know, those sort of bucket list things, it is a bucket list experience. And I think that that, you know, people can book that now. Um, and, yeah, and, I mean, uh, price wise, it, it should be reasonably competitive as well because um, totally. I mean we did it one of our first family cruises with with Princess on Sun Princess around the top of Australia yeah, um, but yeah it's just a just an awesome itinerary and particularly yeah. with those that haven't cruised before it's a longer itinerary but you're not necessarily out at sea too many days so no. it's no. it's a good no. one anyway thank Fantastic. you once again for for coming along we'll catch up again next week for for more updates on on what's been happening awesome. But okay. um, thanks once again, and we'll see, see you next week. See you later. Thanks, Good Bruce. Day. Thanks, Bye. mate. Bye.